Yeah. All right. Live on Periscope. Yeah. Live on Facebook. What's up? It's Prophet David Taylor here. I'm here for my weekly live prophetic word. I come on this time every Sunday. Sunday at 2.30 p.m. Central Standard Time is what time it is here in Chicago. So I uh, hope you are enjoying your Sunday. I've got a prophetic word, and it's deep, and it's intense. So let's jump right on in. Thank you, Father, for this day. Thank you for your kindness. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for the truth of your word. Thank you for your spirit. Thank you for the precious Holy Ghost. Oh, God, I surrender myself to you right now. God, I must decrease so you can increase. So speak to me now, God. I surrender my mind, my heart my lips, my teeth, my tongue, my hand gestures, everything, oh God, in your service so that you can have the word spoken that you want spoken, that you might be glorified in all things, that the people might be edified and that the unbelievers might be challenged to turn from their ways. And yea, even the people of God would turn from their ways and turn back to you through the conviction of the Holy Spirit and signs and wonders and miracles shall follow the declared and decreed and prophesied word of God and those that believe it and receive it. And I thank you for it and I believe you for it and we decree it in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen and amen. All right. Uh, as my sister, let me say hello to my sister. So today's prophetic word is prepare. Today's prophetic word is prepare. This word is deep and it's intense, okay? And when you come on the broadcast, please like and share because whenever a prophetic word of God is going forth, we want it to be seen and heard by as many people as possible, okay? So as many people as possible can see and hear the word of God and receive it. Again, today's word is deep and intense, okay? So it's called prepare, all right? Prepare for what? Okay, I'll tell you, for what's coming next. Do you remember how I told you? I either told you last week, uh, what, the last week of August. So two weeks ago, I told you that when September hit, it was gonna be some new stuff. So be sure that you had August business together. Be sure that you, can t- you had taken care of what you had to do for the summer. Because when September hit, it was going to be some new stuff. Okay. Well, the Holy Spirit is showing us today what's coming next. You say there's more stuff coming in 2020? Yeah. Yeah. There's more stuff coming. And we've been talking about that all along about what was coming next. Okay. So today I'm going to go into detail about what's coming next. Okay. According to the scripture. So let's look at our foundational scriptures. Our foundational scripture, our first foundational scripture is Joel chapter two. Joel chapter two. I'm going to put that on the screen. And when I say I put it on the screen, I'm talking about my Facebook live post. If you're watching the YouTube video, it'll be up on the video. Okay. Joel chapter two. Now, Joel chapter two is a very familiar chapter, but as always, you have to ask the Holy Spirit, what is he saying to us today? that applies to our situation in the now, okay? That's why you have to know the written word, but you have to ask the author of the Bible, the Holy Ghost, to help you exegete it, to expound on it, to help you see whatever it is he's trying to tell you for what's going on in the moment. So don't be listening to people that tell you that the Bible is old and archaic and it's not relevant and it doesn't speak to us today, and it's written thousands of years ago, and it's in a bunch of languages and metaphors and things that we can't understand, none of that is true. What is true is that you must study to show yourself approved, like the scripture says, and you must invoke or ask or invite the author of the Bible, which is the Holy Spirit of God, to help you understand what it is he's saying through the scriptures. And just as an aside before I read, That's one of the reasons the Bible is written in parables and metaphor and simile, so that it would be timeless. This is what a lot of people just don't understand. It's written, and and when it was written, it's talking to the audience that it's talking to, but it's also unto generations. It's also always talking to people that weren't born at the time it was written. 
So you have to ask the Holy Ghost to help you understand how is this relevant to my life now? Okay? All right. Joel chapter 2, starting with verse 1. I'm reading out of the New King James Version. Joel is an Old Testament prophet. He's in the Old Testament. Blow the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble. For the day of the Lord is coming, for it is at hand, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness, like the morning clouds spread over the mountain. A people come great and strong, the like of whom has never been, nor will there ever be any such after them, even for many successive generations. A fire devours before them, and behind them a flame burns. The land is like the Garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness. Surely nothing shall escape them. Their appearance is like the appearance of horses, and like swift steeds, so they run. With a noise like chariots over mountaintops, they leap. Like the noise of a flaming fire that devours the stubble, like a strong people set in battle array. Before them, the people writhe in pain. All faces are drained of color. They run like mighty men. They climb the wall like men of war. Everyone marches in formation and they do not break ranks. They do not push one another. Everyone marches in his own column. Though they lunge between the weapons, they are not cut down. They run to and fro in the city. They run on the wall. They climb into the houses. They enter at the windows like a thief. The earth quakes before them. The heavens tremble. The sun and moon grow dark and the stars diminish their brightness. The Lord gives voice before his army, for his camp is very great. For strong is the one who executes his word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible. Who can endure it? All right, that's Job, uh, excuse me, that's Joel chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. And we're going to get to the rest in a minute. Okay, so the question again then becomes, what's that talking about now? Okay, I'll tell you what it's talking about. The answer to that question is found in Revelation chapter 6. Uh, now, remember, I taught on judgments last Thursday on my No More Genies teaching. Last Thursday, 7 o'clock p.m. Central Standard Time. I teach every Thursday night, 7 o'clock p.m. Central Standard Time on No More Genies, uh, which means we get rid of our genie concept of God and see what the word really says. So I taught on judgments and I taught on every horseman, but this one. So go back and review that. That's on my Facebook page. It's on my YouTube channel. Uh, hashtag PDT, Prophet David Taylor. I taught on every horse and every horseman, the four horsemen of the apocalypse. I taught about how everyone has come except this one I'm about to read to you now. That's Revelation chapter six, verses one and two. I want Revelation is in the New Testament. It's the last book in the Bible written by Apostle John, Jesus' best friend on earth. Revelation 6, 1 and 2, I watched as the Lamb opened the first of the seven seals. Then I heard one of the four living creatures say in a voice like thunder, come. I looked and there before me was a white horse. Its rider held a bow and he was given a crown and he rode out as a conqueror bent on conquest. Now, I'm not going to go over everything I taught in the last video, but we talked about the Red Rider, which is the War Horseman. We talked about the Black Rider and the Black Horse with scales in his hand, which is economic upheaval. We talked about the Pale Rider, which was death and hell, and they have the power of the sword, the famine, and the plague. All those have already been released on America. So go back and watch that video again. But what the Holy Spirit is saying today is that the fourth horseman is coming. That's why the prophetic word is prepared. The fourth horseman is conquering or conquest. Now, what that typically means is that God delivers you into the hand of your enemies. And that's what it always meant for the Hebrews in the scriptures, that when they backslid and rebelled against God, God would raise up another nation against them and deliver them into the hand of their enemies. So I don't quite know what that's going to look like for us, but we're going to get some clues for the scripture. But it does mean 
that this conquering is coming. It doesn't mean that the white horse is coming. The white horse has a bow, but no arrows. Pay attention to that. The white horse, ha white horse has a bow, but no arrows because some of the power is the power of illusion to look like a conqueror. And he was given a crown and he rode out as a conqueror bent on conquest. Sometimes what that means is that it doesn't look like the enemy are coming against you should be able to overcome you because they look like they're not strong enough or there's not enough of them or whatever have you. How many armies, how many great nations have lost wars because they underestimated their opponent? Okay, so let's go back to Joel, but understand that what the Holy Spirit is saying today, what this means is that this is coming, it's been released. Okay, and some of it's already here. And our clues are in Joel chapter two. So back in Joel chapter two, it talks about blow the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm. That's why the prophetic word for today is prepare. I'm sounding an alarm from the Holy Ghost that this conquering, this conquest is coming, whatever it looks like. It says, for the day of the Lord is coming. Now, when you see the phrase in the Bible in English, the day of the Lord, Almost without exception, that's talking about a day of judgment. Now, remember, I explained all this to you in the No More Genius on Thursday night. But long story short, God writes down everything in his books. God writes down everything you say. God writes down everything you do. And God writes down all of your motives. So every word that comes out of your mouth is written in a book in heaven. And every choice you make is written in a book in heaven. But what you were thinking and feeling, why you did what you say, what you do, and why you do it is all written down before God. So when you confess your sins and you keep short, short accounts with God and you confess every day, the blood of Jesus washes that clean from before his throne. When you do not repent of your sin, your sin piles up like dirty trash. And just like when there's too much trash in your house and the stench becomes too much and you can't take it anymore, you have to get it out. When the stench of sin piles up before God in heaven, and gets in his nose and he can't take it anymore, he releases judgments. He opens seals, he blows trumpets, and he releases horsemen. What are the judgments of God designed to do? They're always designed to do just one thing, wipe stuff out. In the days of Noah, when he released the judgment of the flood, it wiped humanity out. When Pharaoh went after Moses and the children of Israel, when uh, Moses and the children of Israel went through the Red Sea on dry land, Pharaoh tried, sea closed in, wiped them out. When they were fornicating in the wilderness, the Bible said it was about 15,000 of them dropped in one day, wiped them people out. When God got mad at them for worshiping the golden calf, he told Moses, I'm going to wipe them out and I'm going to make Israel out of your children. OK, so when the judgments of God are released, they only have one function, one purpose. That's to wipe stuff out. So that's what, when it says the day of the Lord. Now, let me give you some more context. What that means, okay, 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 okay. This is an old school black people thing. <clears throat> you know how you can be playing with your siblings and you can be playing with your cousins and old school, you were on the back porch or in the basement. If you started making too much noise and you started fighting or scuffling with your cousins or your brothers or your sisters, as little kids are known to do, your father or your grandfather would open the door and say, David, whoever else is down there with you, you know, your cousins, cut out all that noise. Don't make me come down there and tell you to cut that out. Your father or your grandfather was only going to do that one time. If you kept, as they would say, acting a fool, and if you kept cutting up and then you start fighting with your cousin and then y'all get all crazy, then your father or your grandfather is coming down the steps and he's not going to be talking. He's going to come down with a broom in his hand or a belt in his hand or his bare hand, which you don't want. You don't want the bare hand of an angry black man. And he's going to start to regulate. There's going to be no more talking. He's going to start regulating, okay, lighting. Your grandmother would light your thighs up and your behind up with a switch. Your grandfather is going to light your behind up with his hand or a belt, okay? Well, that's the day of the Lord. That's the analogy that God done warned us and warned us and warned us and warned us and warned us to stop acting a fool, to stop worshiping idols, to stop worshiping everything but him. 
to stop living in ways that are not pleasing to God most high. He done warned us and warned us and warned us and warned us. And remember I told you, when you don't repent, all of that stuff is still written in the book because you haven't asked God to forgive you. You haven't confessed your sin. So when he shows up, many times God will let things go on, sometimes for years, sometimes for decades, and then he's going to show up in one day. And he's going to show up in one day with all of the information about all the wrong that you did with his judgments in his hand. That's what the day of the Lord means. That's why the Bible always says it's terrible. Because God might show up with 30 years worth of sins in his hand from you. That's why you hear me tell you all the time, and also he does it with nations. That's why you hear me tell you all the time that this is a relationship, it's not a religion. Don't be listening to those people that tell you that this is some type of formula, that all you have to do is you know do some hand motions and throw some money on the altar, and this is a relationship with a person. God is a person, not a set of rules. And if you have never confessed your sins before the Lord, and if you don't confess your sins every day, and you just keep living like, like, like God's judgments and what the Lord thinks doesn't matter, he might stay silent for 30 years. But during them 30 years, just because he don't say nothing, doesn't mean he's not doing anything. He's writing down everything that you're saying and doing and why you're doing it. And then one day he's just going to show up like your angry grandfather coming down the steps. And he's not going to be talking. He's going to show up with judgments. And God does that for individuals. God does that for families. God does that for states, regions. And God does that for nations. And God does that for the whole planet. He did it in the days of Noah. He showed up and opened up the floodwaters and wiped us all out. Before that happened, we had this testimony that we had so grieved him. He said that the thoughts of our hearts, remember motives, are evil and wicked continually from our youth up. So he'd studied everybody from the young people to the elderly people. And he said, mankind won't do nothing but imagining evil. And then God said, I'm sorry that I made you. Things were so bad, God said, I'm sorry that I made humans and wiped us out, wiped us out down to one family of eight. So this is not a joke and it's not a game. So when you see the day of the Lord, as it says in verse one, for the day of the Lord is coming, for it is at hand, that's what it's talking about. It's talking about God showing up with his years and years and years of written judgments against you or your family or your country because you haven't been listening to what the Lord's been saying. <clears throat> it says a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness, like the morning clouds spread over the mountain. Uh, it says it on in here again later. Uh, and I told my cousin when I talked to her about that, uh, it's in verse 10, the earth quakes before them, the heavens tremble, the sun and moon grow dark and the stars diminish their brightness. Okay, everything that's happening on the West Coast right now is a sign. Remember that the Lord told you that before the very, very, very end, there would be signs and wonders in the heavens. It is a sign on the West Coast that the skies have turned orange in some places and just blood red. Like if you look at some of the pictures over Oregon, it's just blood red. It looks like a filter, but it's no filter. The sun is blocked out. My cousin told me they couldn't tell the difference between 5 a.m. and 8 a.m. And they had to turn on lights inside the house because they couldn't see the sun. It's from the fire, the smoke, the ash, and the soot, but it's still a sign. It's a sign of judgment that I just read to you about how it's darkness and gloominess and you can't see the sun. That's a sign of judgment. That's why that happened. So I will repeat, don't let anybody tell you that the Bible is not up to, up to the minute, up to date, relevant right now. You're living it right now. And if you don't believe it, then just wait and see. So God says in Joel uh, chapter two, verse three, a people come great and strong, the like of whom has never been, been, nor will there ever be any such after them, even for many successive generations. A fire devours before them uh, and behind them a flame burns. The land is like the garden of Eden before them and behind them a desolate wilderness. Surely nothing shall escape them. <sighs> That's talking about uh, an army now to the children of Israel 
uh, it was talking about, if I'm not mistaken, the Assyrians. And that's what was coming against them during that time. But uh, it also could be talking about locusts. When it says a great army, it's not necessarily talking about people. Because remember I told you, that's why many times the Bible will speak in metaphor. That's why many times the Bible will speak in parable because there's more meaning to it. So this could be talking about an actual nation of people that are going to attack, or it could be talking about actual locusts, or it could be talking about something that has the effect of locusts. A fire devours before them and behind them a flame burns. The land is like a garden of Eden before them and behind them a desolate wilderness. That's one of the, the clues that we have that we know is a fierce army, either of humans or some type of locust, because it basically says they're going to devour. So in other words, the land is going to be lush and green like the Garden of Eden, Eden as the earth was new, full of fruit, full of vegetation. And by the time they get through with it, and they're going to be nothing but a desolate wilderness. Surely nothing shall escape them. This is the final judgment. This is the judgment of the white rider. This is the judgment of conquering or conquest. And the Holy Spirit is saying it's coming. And part of it's already here because you saw the sign on the West Coast. I'm not sure, once again, I'm not sure exactly what that's going to look like practically. Just like I prophesied, many of us prophesied that famine and pestilence were coming. And then COVID dropped. COVID actually dropped last year. But it hit, the lockdown started in America mid-March. Okay? And we've been dealing with the global pandemic and the fallout ever since. We're still dealing with it, okay? And so not quite sure what this is going to look like, know for of a surety that it's coming. If it's an actual play, because remember earlier this summer, remember we had murder hornets? Do you remember that? That's what this is talking about, something like that. What if there was an army of murder hornets, but was there more than we've ever seen before that we, we couldn't fight? What would happen to our crops? What would happen to our food? What would happen to our health if they just you just walk outside and it's just so many bees or so many locusts or so many murder hornets, you can't get away from it. Don't think such a thing couldn't happen. It happened to Egypt with the 10 plagues, remember? Remember that God sent armies of natural things. This is why people amaze me talking about it's all natural phenomena. It's natural phenomena as orchestrated by the word of God. Okay, frogs, lice, locusts water turning to blood, brimstone from heaven, death of the firstborn, flies. All those were directed by the hand of God and spoken by Moses. You understand? So I'm not sure, again, exactly what form this is going to take. It says, before them, the people writhe in pain. That could be from captivity. That could be from being stung. All faces are drained of color. They run like mighty men. They climb the wall like men of war. Everyone marches in formation. They do not break ranks. Those are verses 6 and 7 of Joel chapter 2. Verse 10, 11. The earthquakes before them, the heavens tremble. The sun and the moon grow dark. That has already happened on the West Coast. They can't see the sun. I told you I'm not making this up. I told you this is not archaic. This is up to the moment. And stars diminish their brightness. The Lord gives voice before his army. For his camp is very great. For strong is the one who executes his word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible. Who can endure it? Now, I'm going to stop a minute. You need to understand what that's talking about. That's talking about God basically flexing, to use our slang. That's talking about God showing you that he's God. And we are not. Sometimes your father or your grandfather has to do that with young pups, young cubs coming up because there's nothing that a young boy or a young man likes to do more than challenge an older man, challenge your father, challenge your grandfather, challenge your pastor. That's very typical of youth. That's what young boys do, challenge authority. And sometimes them middle-aged men or older men or whatever men you thought you could whip, sometimes they end up regulating on you because they know things that you don't know. And sometimes they'll do things that you didn't know they could do. And many times when I was growing up, my father put me in check because he's the daddy and I was the son. I was the child. Well, the Lord is saying here that 
Many times people think that because the Lord is gracious and loving and kind and merciful, that he's weak. You're mistaken. It's just that the Lord is patient. It's just that God is not, God is a good God. God is slow to anger and of great mercy. But when you push him and when you provoke him and you will not do right and you will not repent and you will not obey and you will not hear, then the Lord's going to flex on you to show you who's the daddy. Then the Lord's going to show you who is God and who is not. Just like if you study out the 10 plagues of Egypt, they were all designed to topple a very specific God of the Egyptians. Each one of those plagues was designed for the God of heaven, the God of the Hebrews, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God that Moses was serving to show the Egyptians that that God is God. And all the mother gods you serving are idols. They're false gods. They ain't real. They're, they're made of stone. They're made of wood, but they don't have no power. So it's as strong as the one who executes his word. So all them people that laugh at Jesus and all them people that laugh at Christians and all them people that laugh at prophets and all the people that laugh and say that we're crazy and that the Lord is some type of pacifist. And being a Christian just means how much abuse can I take and still keep smiling? You're mistaken. If you wonder why there's been so much weeping and wailing in the land, that's God flexing. That's God disciplining and chastising his children. And that's God wiping out some things, showing you that he is God and he is to be feared and respected and reverenced. Just like your father, your grandfather, your pastor sometimes have to put you in check. This is what God does with nations. That's what's been happening, and that's what's happening now. For strong is the one who executes his word, for the day of the Lord is great and very terrible. What that means is when everything hit, it's going to be awful. You think things have been awful so far. Every time you think, have you noticed that every time you think things can't get any worse, another layer breaks out? From the pandemic to somebody being shot unjustly, to riots, to looting, to fires, the entire West Coast on fire, the entire West Coast on fire, to so much ash and soot in the air that you can't see the sun. And then there's the other stuff that goes on because people are still dying from heart attacks. People are still dying uh, in car accidents. People are still dying from cancer. All that other stuff is still happening. And people are dying all over people great and small from all walks of life, sometimes for no discernible reason, for things that don't even make any sense. Well, there's going to be a lot of weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth and people saying, what's happening? What's going on? Why is this happening? We don't understand. Because the day of the Lord, when God shows up with his book of judgments against all your sins that you've never confessed and repented of, it's going to be terrible. I will repeat, the Lord might not say nothing for 30 years. Just because he doesn't say anything doesn't mean he's not writing it down. He's giving you time to change your ways. And if you just harden your heart and you stiffen your neck and you not going to change and you not going to repent and you're not going to be sorry, then the Lord going to show up and flex and show you that he is nobody to play with. It's going to be terrible. Remember how when the pandemic first hit, the first thing we said was we don't have enough respirators. And the medical people said right away, then we're going to have to start deciding who lives and who dies. And just because that stuff isn't on TV anymore doesn't mean that it's going away. Because plenty of people have gone through COVID and recovered, but plenty of people have gone through and it's one of the worst experiences they had. And a lot of people just didn't make it. Okay. So just fair warning that it's going to be awful. So just understand, if you listen to me live or you're watching the replay, that's why I keep telling you, you always want to share this video so as many people can that can have a chance to hear the word of God can hear it. It's going to be awful because as a nation, we have not turned from our evil ways. We still doing all the stuff that the Lord told us to let go of. And when I say we, judgment always starts with the church. Remember, I explained all this on Thursday in No More Genies 27. You need to watch it. All the stuff that the Lord has been calling us to do for the last six years, since the end of 2014. 
If we're not doing that, do you understand that we are disobedient? We are what you call bones out of joint. What is a bone out of joint? It's the same thing that happens in your body if you twist an ankle or break an elbow or just something isn't right or if you bust a rib or, or anything, anytime your bone isn't lined up the way it needs to be, that pain is excruciating. If you sprain your wrist, if, if you break your finger, if your finger is bent the wrong way, if you have a bone out of joint, if your foot, anything in your foot, that pain is excruciating. You can't stand it. Well, when we're not obedient to the head of the church of Jesus Christ, we are bones out of joint as a body. That means we are causing the Lord great pain. Do you understand that? When God tells his body to do something and we don't do it, we are bones out of joint. That means we are causing him pain. And just like you would do whatever you needed to to get that pain to stop, when the Lord shows up, it's the exact same thing. And the Lord has been telling us to do some very specific things as Christians since the end of 2014. Get rid of all our religion and denominationalism. Stop being racist. Racism doesn't have a place in the body of Christ. Come together in love under the banner of the Lord Jesus Christ. Allow every member of the body of Christ to find their spot on Jesus' body and get in your place. If you the nose, stop trying to be the ears. If you the wrist, stop trying to be the elbow. If you the knee, stop trying to be the ankle. If you the lungs, stop trying to be the eyes. God's been telling us that for at least six years, that you need to get in your place. Prophet Taylor, are you doing that? Yes, I am. I'm here prophesying right now. That's my place. And I'm releasing my music and I'm writing my books. I mean, I'm just to let you know that I, I'm doing what I'm saying. I'm not running my mouth. I'm not saying one thing and doing something else. I'm prophesying like the Lord told me. I'm saying what the Lord told me to say. I'm doing my music. I'm releasing my music. I have my hymn release every month. I have my gospel music. I'm releasing my books. I'm putting into the world what God called me to do. So I'm trying not to cause Jesus any pain by being disobedient and being a bone out of joint. I'm trying to function the way he told me to function, to be in his place, excuse me, be in my place in his body. That's what every Christian is supposed to be doing, regardless of skin color, regardless of gender, regardless of age. That's what I know a lot of saints don't understand. You still turning your nose up at certain people talk about you don't want to worship with them. Oh, Lord, have mercy. God called us six years ago to become a light to the unbelievers, to show that we can all come together under the banner of Christ and we can all get along in love under the authority and leadership of Jesus. We do what we do because we love him. We do what we do because our eyes are on him. God called us to get rid of racism, get rid of denomination, denominationalism and division in the body of Christ and get in your place. If you not anointed to preach, stop trying to preach. Do what the Lord told you to do. Maybe he didn't call you to preach. Maybe he called you to run for office. Maybe he called you to be a school teacher. You have some power in your mouth, but it's not for preaching or pastoring. Maybe you're supposed to be an alderman or a congressman or a senator. Maybe you're supposed to be a school teacher or a principal or, or a motivational speaker. You have to ask the Lord, but stop trying to do stuff you're not anointed to do. Stop trying to be something that you're not. You're a bone out of joint and you're causing the Lord pain when you're not in your place. Some of y'all looking at me right now, God told you to move before the pandemic hits and you're still in the town that you were. And the Lord told you to go to another city, another state a long time ago. If you're not living in the city and state that the Lord told you to go to, you are a bone out of joint. You are not doing what the Lord told you to do. You're still doing what you want to do. And that is what is causing the Lord that pain. God been talking to us, the body of Christ, the believers, for the last six years since the end of 2014. God been telling us this, what I'm saying now, over and over and over again. God's been telling us that those that don't believe in apostles and prophets are going to have to get over it. Because God did not say three. God said five. God said apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. There are plenty of denominations Protestant denominations say, we don't believe there one but 12 apostles. Ain't no more prophets. All that is incorrect. There are apostles and prophets right now. It is an office. But they said, we just believe in evangelists, pastors, and teachers. We don't believe in the apostolic and the prophetic. That's wrong. That's not biblical. 
We ain't supposed to speak in tongues. That's wrong. First Corinthians 14, desire spiritual gifts, but more so that you may prophesy. It doesn't say ye Pentecostals. It doesn't say ye black people. It doesn't say ye holy rollers. That ain't what it said. It said you believers are supposed to desire spiritual gifts and more so that you may prophesy. That's talking to all Christians. So this foolishness that we've had in the body of Christ all these years about arguing about who was saved and who isn't saved and arguing about eternal security and, oh, you can lose your salvation and go to hell and ain't no more apostles and prophets and, oh, you're not saved unless you got fully immersed in the water. Those that believe in water baptism, that you're not really saved unless you got dunked in the water. The thief on the cross wasn't baptized. And the Lord said, this day you're going to be with me in paradise. Okay, none of the people, to our knowledge, that were in Sheol, Hades, the underworld, when the Lord went down there and preached to them, did they get baptized before they died? Were they even doing water baptism in the Old Testament? When they walked through the Red Sea, that was their baptism as Israel. But I'm talking about the way we do it, the way Jesus got dunked in the River Jordan by John the Baptist, the way we do that. Did any of those people that died before Jesus was born, did they get water baptized like that? How are you going to say they couldn't make it in heaven if Jesus went down to hell or to Hades and to Sheol to preach to him, to get him out of the underworld, to tell him that he was the Messiah? Oh, I could go on. This foolish denominational stuff that we've been arguing about, God said that is over six years ago. Are you hearing me? Acts chapter 10. God said six years ago. You're not supposed to be keeping Indians out of your congregation. You're not supposed to be keeping black people out of your congregation. White people, Japanese, Korean, Chinese, Vietnamese, Italian, German, Kenan, Kenyan, Ghana, uh, Egyptian, doesn't matter. You're not supposed to be turning your nose up. If God has called a group of people to come fellowship with you, you're supposed to welcome them because they're part of the body. And God is trying to get his body in place. For six years, are you hearing me? So if you haven't heard what I'm, what the Holy Spirit's been saying, what I've been prophesying up to this point, then you better hear it now. If you're not living in the place you're supposed to be living in, you better get your hat, get your kids and move to where God told you to be. If you're not married to the right person, if you're not dating the right person, you better break up with them. If the Holy Spirit has told you they're not the one, Leave them, leave them alone. I know you don't want to. I know it's going to hurt. I know it's going to hurt you. I know all that. But if the Holy Ghost have told you that's not your wife or that's not your husband, leave them alone. Okay? If God has called you to do something and you fight them, I understand. I understand. I struggled with my prophetic call for a very long time. It's a Garden of Gethsemane moment where God has asked you to do something and Jesus went to the garden and said, Father, please except we never tell that story right. The Lord wasn't just talking like I'm talking. He was working out like you work out in the gym. He was sweating. He was sweating so hard in prayer until he started bleeding sweat. He was moving like you would be like on a treadmill. You know how when you get on a treadmill and after you run about 20 minutes, you, he was praying like that. We never tell that story right. It's not no little picture of Jesus with his hands and blueberries and oh, like he's Snow White. It's not that. The Lord was moving. <laughs> like the first 20 minutes of a workout on a treadmill. And he was, that's why he only wanted Peter, James, and John to go with him. Because ain't nobody ever seen him like that. He was struggling so hard with going to the cross. He was wrestling before Father. Father, please, if there's any other way, take this cup from me. That's what it was like. It wasn't like the little pictures that you see. Okay? So I do understand. And the Lord Jesus Christ does understand when you're wrestling with the will of God. It's something you don't want to do. But just like Jesus, the Lord, the Jesus stayed in prayer until Father showed him everything he needed to see. And then the Lord came up saying, not my will, but thine be done. And he made up his mind to go to the cross. And the Lord did the same thing for me. He told me stuff and he showed me stuff and he helped me understand why he called me to obey him and do what he created me to do. And I came up saying, not my will, but thine be done. And I'm so glad that I obeyed God. But I'm saying all that to encourage you. Stop fighting him. If God called you to go back to school, get your hat and go back to school. If God called you to be a stay-at-home mom, stop listening to all them other people telling you that that ain't right or whatever. If you know the Lord has called you to do that, you're supposed to be doing what the Lord told you to do. Six years, are you hearing me?
Six years. And if you're not in place by now, then the day of the Lord is coming. The Lord is going to show up and flex like your angry grandfather that was shouting down into the basement telling you to stop acting a fool. Stop living your own way and get into obedience. That's what's happening right now. So if you're looking at me live or you're watching this replay, you can't say you didn't know. You can't st stand before the Lord and say, well, Lord, I didn't know. The Lord going to say, yes, you did. I sent prophet after prophet. I'm not the only prophet. I'm, I'm not one of the people that think, you know, because some people act like they're the prophet. I mean, stay away from folk like that. The prophet is Jesus, okay? <laughs> we just part of his body, okay? And so the Lord will send you prophet after prophet. The Lord will have people that don't even know you say stuff to you to give you a witness that that's him talking to you, okay? Stop acting fool. Stop being rebellious and get in place six years. And if you don't, then, then father, just like your biological father or your biological grandfather or your father figure or your pastor, go have to regulate. All right. Now that leads us to Joel chapter two, verses 12. Now, therefore, it says the Lord, verses 12 through when I get through. Now, therefore, it says the Lord, turn to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping and with mourning. So rend your heart and not your garments. What does that mean? In the Old Testament, one of the signs of them being in repentance and being in mourning and being aware of sin is that they would literally tear their clothes. That was a sign. Uh, that was an outward sign of what was supposed to be an inward truth. But God say, I don't want you going through the motions. That's what it means to rend your garments. You, you have all these big repentance rituals you do, but your heart ain't no different in here. God said, no, tear your heart. Tear your heart, not your garments. I need you to change in here. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness. I told you God is a good God, and he relents from doing harm. Who knows if he will turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. Now, let me tell you what that means in no uncertain terms. Some people that will not hear the voice of the Lord are going to die. I'll probably tell you you shouldn't say that. Yeah, well, that's what the spirit of the Lord is saying. Some people that will not hear God, that will not obey, are not going to make it out of 2020. Don't be one of them people. But the Bible says uh, he's gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and he relents from doing harm. Who knows if you will turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him? This is what I've been saying all summer long. If we would repent and get ourselves together, okay, and turn from those things that don't please the Lord and get into obedience, then that's when God begins to pull judgment back and begins to heal the land. And that has to start with the Christians first. If my people that are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face, amend their ways, turn from their wicked ways, then shall I hear from heaven, okay? So believers have to do it first, which just makes sense. Why would God expect unbelievers to hear him first? He would expect his own children to hear him first, just like you would with your children. If your children are outside playing with a bunch of people and you call out there and you say, David, you want your son to turn around, okay? Because you want your son to hear your voice more so than all the other children. See, so once again, this stuff is not rocket science. It's not hard and God ain't crazy and you ain't crazy, okay? So that's what the Lord is saying is you need to change in here and change in here so you can get into place and stop doing a bunch of stuff. You see God wiped out the, all of our standard church services. People are still fighting to go to church, but you see all that religious stuff we're doing. Do you see that God shut it down, wiped it out? Why do you think that happened? To give us time so you could have some one-on-one -on -one time alone with the Lord so you could make sure you know Christ for yourself and make sure that you are doing what Christ has personally called you to do. And that was been the point of these last six months. And if you think that it's just supposed to be a rush back to the way it was, you have missed the whole point of the summer. You're mistaken. What's supposed to happen by now is that you're supposed to be in whatever place you need to be in. And that's many times why God uses isolation. He does that in the Bible with the prophets all the time. He'll just isolate, just cut you off from everybody else. So it's just you and him so he can talk to you. So he can get your attention and talk to you and show you what he wants you to do from this point forward. If you're going to go through a pandemic and the West Coast on fire and people dropping like flies, flies and rides in the streets and, and you're still not going to do what the Lord said, do then some people are not. You, you clearly don't want to serve God. Some people are not going to make it out of 2020. I'm talking about some Christians and I talk about sinners right now. I'm talking about believers. 
that just gonna keep doing what they want. They're not going to make it. So do not be surprised in the days and the weeks and the months to come when you see some of the people dying that ended up dying. Behold, I have told you before. But for those that will believe and obey, who knows if he will return to relent, verse 14, and leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering, uh, a drink offering for the Lord your God. Uh, verse 15, blow the trumpet in Zion, consecrate a fast, call a sacred assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children and nursing babes, let the bridegroom go out from his chamber and the bride from her dressing room. Let the priests who minister to the Lord weep between the porch and the altar. Let them say, spare your people, O Lord, and do not give your heritage to reproach, that the nation should rule over them. Why should they say among the peoples, where is their God? What does that mean to us? And what does that mean in plain language? But then blow the trumpet is once again, sound the alarm. Consecrate a fast means turn your plate down. You should have fasting as a regular part of your life as a Christian anyway. Um, what kind of fast you're on is individual. You know, that's a whole nother subject, but you should have fasting as a regular part of your life. Call the sacred assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation. Sanctify means to set apart, assemble the elders. Here, listen to this right here. It says, gather the children and nursing babes. Let the bridegroom go out from his chamber and the bride from her dressing room. What does that mean? God just told you that there is no age restriction. God said the kids and even the babe, babies that are still nursing at their mother's breast, bring them to. Don't tell me that, don't tell me that God doesn't hold you responsible when you're young. You don't have the same level of responsibility at eight that you would at 28, but that doesn't mean you have no responsibility. Because when God sent the floodwaters of Noah, he said, the thoughts of man are evil continually from his youth up. The Bible just told you there is not an age restriction on this thing. God said the nursing babes, babies that are just out the womb, God said, bring them to, bring them before me. Because whatever you see, you never forget. You know that, right? I know you know that. Haven't you ever been walking down the street or doing something completely innocuous? And then a song comes on or you smell something and it takes you back years. You know what I'm talking about? Like like you, your favorite bakery or the perfume your grandma used to wear or when your auntie would make a certain kind of food or the song that was playing, like when you went to the prom or something like that. And something takes you back. You know why? Because all the memories are in there. You don't keep all your memories in your short term conscious memory because that would drive you crazy. But it, you keep them in your long term memory. But a, a stimulus can happen to pull the memory up because you don't forget anything. That's why God says, you bring children that are still on their mother's breast. You bring them before me. You include the youngest members of the congregation. Let them see me move. Let them know that I'm God. It will make an impact on that young life, even though they can't even talk yet. God said, let the bridegroom go out from his chamber and the bride from her dressing room. God said, I don't care if you married, fitting to get married, want to get married, about to get married, in your wedding dress, about to walk down the aisle, you come out here and pay attention to me. Woe unto you if you put in your wedding before what thus saith the Lord. If you wanted them people, then woe unto you. God says, God says, I don't care if you've got the veil attached to your head. Come pay attention to me. Okay? Let the priests who minister to the Lord weep between the porch and the altar. Let them say, spare your people, O Lord. That's intercession. And do not give your heritage to reproach. What that means practically is that we've been asking the Lord to have mercy on America that the nation should rule over them. Don't let our enemies rule over us. Why should they say among the people's where is their God? Don't give us over to captivity. Don't let America be destroyed because right now we're being destroyed little by little. The land is burning up. The people are dying. People are going crazy. People are burning up. Have you noticed that? The intercession is to ask God to please spare us from total destruction. Then the Bible says, verse 18, then the Lord will be zealous for his land and pity his people. The Lord will answer and say to his people, behold, I will send you grain and new wine and oil, and you will be satisfied by them. I will no longer make you approach among the nations. Okay, what does that mean? Uh, I will remove far from, verse 20, I will remove far from you the northern army and will drive him away into a barren and desolate land with his face toward the eastern sea and his back toward the western sea. His stench will come up, his foul odor will rise because he has done monstrous things monstrous things. What that means in the nutshell is that God would push the enemies back. God will push the judgments back and then give us grain and new wine and oil. Wine and oil 
are luxuries. They're signs of economic prosperity. Grain is always talking about bread and seed, the ability to sow again, the ability to have a harvest again. Remember how there was a run on everything when the pandemic hit? A run on toilet paper, a run on water, a run on bread. Do you remember that? God is saying he wants to reverse that. And he will if we repent. And that's the best news all day. Even in the midst of all this terrible judgment, even in the midst of the terrible day of the Lord, if we rend our heart and not our garments, if we're not just going through the motions, but we make up in our minds and our hearts that we're going to do what the Lord say do and stop trying to be the Lord over our own lives and stop hating people because their skin color is different, that don't have any place in the life of a believer. If unbelievers do it, that's one thing. Christians don't have no business being racist. Did you know that? Did you know how many Christians are racist? They racist as a day is long. That is not from God. God made all nations from one blood and Jesus shed his blood. He paid the same price for all of us. How are you going to hate somebody and Jesus died for them just like he died for you? Racism doesn't have any place among believers. Did you know that? So God says, if we change and hear him, he's going to be zealous for his land. He's going to take pity on us. Then he'll give us a new answer. He's going to give us economic prosperity back luxuries back and grain and seed and bread and we'll be satisfied in other words no more runs at the grocery store is going to be plenty again and i will no longer make you reproach among the nations you can't tell me that america is not a reproach because the things that we've done just the pandemic alone has made us look ridiculous in the eyes of the rest of the world the way we've handled it because we've had other nations handle it 10 times better than we have but God says he wants to take that reproach away. So don't tell me the Bible is not right now. And if you don't want to hear it, you won't be able to stand before God and say, I didn't know. Do not look at me. It's not about the vessel that the message is coming through. Well, who's David Taylor think he is? That don't have nothing to do with nothing. Hear what the spirit is saying to the church. That's the point. Okay. All right, uh, and the rest of the verses are talking about all the things that God will do to restore. You're familiar with Joel 2 in the later verses where it talks about restore. That's why it talks about in verse 25, the locusts, the different kinds of locusts, because locusts, there are many different kinds of locusts. And they that's the great army that devours and leaves desolation behind them. God says, I'm gonna restore that, okay? Then it talks about verse 28. Point out a spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams and your young men shall see visions. You know what that means? That means hope is going to spring forth. We're going to have a reason to live. We're going to see something before us that gives us a better future than our present to make us want to live and get to that future. And people are going to be prophesying and filled with the Holy Ghost. I have claimed that for my family. You need to claim that for your family. It doesn't matter what they're doing now. Just claim it that God's going to fill them with the Holy Ghost and they're going to be speaking in tongues and prophesying and doing what the Lord said to do. Verse 30, and I will show wonders in the heavens and the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. Didn't we see a fire tornado on the TikTok? Go look that up on TikTok. It was like two or three days ago. There was literally a fire tornado. Don't tell me the, oh, don't tell me the Bible isn't relevant. You're living it, okay? And so God has given us all these signs, he said, before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. So I'm going to wrap this up. So understand that the day of the Lord is coming, yeah, even it's here. If you want to be on the right side of it, then it's time to repent. Turn from what you were doing and how you were living and get into obedience in every area that you know how. Whatever area the Lord is telling you to conform to his word, it's time to do it and stop being rebellious. If you don't want to hear that, you're going to die. The end. A lot of people aren't going to make it out of 2020. But for those that hear and obey, then there will be a restoration of prosperity. Do you understand? All right. Amen and amen. That is a deep and intense word, but it's what thus saith the Lord. Now, uh, I'm going to go in spirit and ask the Holy Ghost if there's anything else he wants me to share. Okay. Okay. I think we're good. All right. Amen and amen. That's it for this Sunday. Uh, remember, this will be up on YouTube sometime tonight or tomorrow. And my YouTube format is different. 
Remember that my prophetic devotional is available quarter four is on sale now. Uh, remember to check out my music on Prophet David Taylor and Shades of the Cross. I have my hymns, I have my gospel music, I have my workout, gospel music, I have my rap, gospel music, lots of different styles there. Okay. Uh, if you want to bless my ministry, you can sell into my ministry. Uh, my cash app is dollar sign DMT and then the uh, capital I's, not the number two, DMT, two capital I's. You want to bless my ministry and so into my ministry. My ministry has been a blessing to you. If you'd like to bless me. Okay. All right. Amen. And God bless. Thank you so much. I love you. God bless you. I will see you the same time, this same time next week, next Sunday, 2.30 p.m. Central Standard Time for the next weekly live prophetic word. All right. Amen. And God bless. And sickness is his weapon To fill my days with strife And cut me off